Fantastic. So uh, first of all, also, thanks a lot uh, to uh, Demi. It was a quite interesting session and I like the, the Morpheus uh, meme, which uh, considers a cloud just another computer, wherever that's located. And of course, that can uh, be a huge risk in all this uh, supply, ch supply chain uh, components. The other companies that you interact with pose a huge risk uh, also for your own security, uh, like uh, detailed uh, explained uh, in detail by Demi. Um, so welcome to this uh, second session of today. Um, I will discuss uh, mainly how you can actually go to the cloud with your infrastructure with confidence, specifically looking at security. So we will uh, briefly discuss in the following 30 to 35 minutes, let's say, uh, all aspects about continuous security, uh, threat prevention, visibility and governance, and how you can achieve this across all clouds, networks, and also all kinds of workloads. This means we will not just uh, talk, let's say, about virtual machines, but we will also uh, discuss uh, uh, Kubernetes-based microservice architectures, uh, functions as a service, and all that stuff. Um, my session will be uh, pretty fast, and as there's a lot of components, as you can imagine, which are relevant, um, this I will not be able to go to all depths. Um, therefore, I would like to already um, invite you to another session that will be done by Checkpoint on March uh, 31st, uh, 11 a.m. CT. If you are interested, you can register there as well. This will be like a deep, deep dive session in comparison to this one, uh, taking about one hour instead of just a half. Um, about myself, my name is Christopher Luthert. I'm a cloud security expert at Checkpoint. I joined Checkpoint uh, about 12 years ago. Uh, I was a pre-sales uh, engineer at Checkpoint covering mostly uh, financial and insurance customers for the last 10 years. Before last year, I transitioned in a new position as an overlay cloud security expert. Um, as mentioned before already, uh, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A section uh, where my colleague uh, Ralf Diefenbach uh, is uh, looking at your questions and answering uh, whatever possible uh, while I'm presenting. And what stays open, I will answer uh, gladly after the session. And also here you can see my email address in case anything uh, remains unanswered. A um, few words about uh, Checkpoint. Uh, for those of you that might not know us yet, we are a global leader in the security space with more than 100,000 customers in almost every significant country present. Um, we are delivering cutting edge security technologies for more than 27 years. Uh, we are traded on NASDAQ and currently have more than 5,800 employees. And I would like to start with describing a bit the situation that we find ourselves and, and our companies in today. So, so far, uh, most of us uh, were using a virtual, uh, a typical virtualized data centers. Um, and also you had like centralized, uh, mostly centralized locations. In the past, cloud was not so much of a topic. Uh, then we were uh, seeing lots of applica monolithic uh, applications deployed, so classical three-tier architectures. And uh, also hosted applications were used quite a lot. And this changes now a lot. So this means that from the virtualized environments, we are transitioning to using multiple cloud environments, also private cloud environments. Uh, the centralized locations are dissolving more and more. There's many, many branch offices. All of those, of course, need to be secured as well and, and to securely interconnected. The application monoliths are uh, being replaced by more and more ephemeral uh, container-based architectures. And also uh, in the cloud native architectures, we start to see more and more usage of function as a service uh, kinds like, for example, Lambda functions or uh, Azure functions as two examples of these. And the hosted applications also are transitioning more and more to SaaS based uh, usage. Uh, for example, uh, Microsoft 365 being one solution that's like in, in many cases the starting point for our customers to go in the SaaS space. Um, but more and more uh, uh, big solutions also offer SaaS services and we see those transitions. Uh, with that uh, long goes a uh, strong transition that we uh, see 
um, the release cycles being uh, extremely accelerated. So from the slow release cycles, where specifically looking also at security in the past, uh, it took like days uh, sometimes to uh, get a change request implemented for a firewall as just one example. Now everything is happening at DevOps speed. So this means that a change just goes in the CI CD pipeline and is automatically deployed minutes later. And, and things like IP addresses, for example, are completely ephemeral, which means that an IP address that uh, might exist uh, 10 minutes ago might not exist anymore because the, the amount of, of containers automatically uh, scaled up or scaled down and stuff like this. So, and the specific challenge is, of course, that the uh, security um, for the enterprises and needs to cope with that cloud speed and cloud scale. Um, so these are the key things that usually all of, of uh, the customers uh, have in place in some way. So uh, definitely for the on-prem, you, you would have like network security threat prevention, some kind of posture management, you secure your applications. And also uh, you have something like a, like a sock in place, sorry, for uh, where you do, for example, intelligence and threat hunting. And this now all needs to be extended in the cloud space. So for example, network security needs to be ideally seamlessly extend with the same policies, with the same security level, also from the data center then to the edge and the cloud. In terms of posture management, you need uh, suitable mechanisms that allow you to assess and remediate vulnerabilities and also uh, especially uh, identify and close security uh, gaps, uh, not just like in virtual machines, but definitely across all types of relevant assets, networks, cloud environments, and ideally also, of course, in a consolidated way, because it's like kind of impossible to, to be an expert in all the major cloud platforms and the tendency that, that uh, we also from Checkpoint see with our customers is that they definitely not focus on just a single uh, cloud platform, but most of them are using services from at least two or not even, if not even three different uh, platforms, uh, because they might be uh, the specific one might be better in, in that uh, implementation and other things might be better at another cloud vendor. Um, in terms of application security, you need a proper way to detect and prevent application layer attacks on highly dynamic applications, be it uh, like Kubernetes deployments, Kubernetes clusters, or uh, microservice architectures, uh, Lambda, uh, Azure functions, uh, you name it. And also you need to protect your APIs. In terms of intelligence and threat hunting, um, it's important to have a proper visibility across all things cloud as well. So this is focusing, for example, on, on ways to get all the, the flow logs for the network stuff that's going on in your cloud environments, but also uh, everything that's related to configuration, to API access. So, so what actions took someone in the cloud, what was changed, deployed, configured and stuff like that. With all those uh, critical challenges in mind, uh, we decided it was uh, time for a new product family uh, within our checkpoint uh, solution family, which is uh, the cloud guard. Um, uh, solution family, and this uh, has to follow uh, like three key principles. So of course we want to deliver the best security possible um, in, from uh, starting from the posture management, which is usually the initial trigger uh, of war, where customers approach us and say, we have a requirement to be compliant, uh, follow some regulations, etc., cetera, uh, but also up to advanced threat prevention. Everything that we deliver and, and, and utilize these days in the cloud, of course, should be able to be fully automated. Uh, speaking about automatic deployment, but on the other side as well about automatic generation of uh, policies uh, is just one example, like deploying a, a classical WAF solution somewhere to protect your web, web services which is based on static signatures is something that's just not working anymore in such a highly dynamic field where services might only exist for minutes before automatically being torn down again. And uh, as uh, stated before, it, the solution has to apply to everything that's relevant in the cloud. So across all stages from, from dev uh, staging to production, but also reach uh, uh, fully from the private cloud also to the public cloud and across all workloads. So we, uh, like uh, following the divide and conquer <laughs> the principle, we split it up in like five uh, key pillars or key components. So 
Um, we are speaking about the cloud network uh, threat prevention, um, which is basically allow you, allowing you to, to transition your regular security gateway, fully featured security gateway also in the cloud, but in an extremely agile, modern way. This means it no longer relies on, on like policies where you have IP addresses and source and destination, because as we just learned already, they are totally ephemeral and it doesn't make sense to do this. But instead, for example, policies rely on, on uh, things like security groups, uh, techs, uh, endpoint policy groups, whatever solution we are actually talking about. Um, and so they are uh, agile and you can even like predefine security for your uh, components, which you it didn't even deploy because when you deploy them and apply the proper text, then you already created the security before and they are protected instantly um, thus preventing any delays uh, caused by security in the uh, CICD pipeline. Um, then there's the uh, component of the cloud security posture management. This is where all things related to compliance are uh, protected and also it has to allow, of course, automatic remediation. And there's the uh, part of web application API protection. So this is what actually protects and puts like a defensive layer around your applications. Uh, against uh, direct attacks to whatever application or uh, ideas to, to breach your APIs and, and uh, extract information there. Um, then there's the part of compute protection, focusing on containers and serverless. We will dive into this much more because this consists again on several parts. And then the uh, last but not least, uh, the part where you look into everything that's related to the cloud intelligence based on analysis of uh, logs, audit logs, flow logs, and everything relating to this. And everything that I just discussed at wherever a point of it uh, is possible and makes sense, of course, should, to, uh, should be shifted left, uh, which means you should uh, uh, place the protections, the security, the scans, whatever component we are talking about, already in this CD pipeline. And I will give more examples on this uh, while we follow up with the different components. So let's uh, focus first of all on the cloud security posture management. The idea is uh, to get complete visibility across all assets, workloads, security policies in all networks, regions, accounts, clouds, Kubernetes on-prem uh, uh, and in the public cloud as well. Um, but this is not good enough. Of course, you also need to have continuous enforcement um, which also should provide uh, active protection and also automatic remediation if something comes up. Um, it has to be fully automatic, so um, it's not good enough to, to just uh, check a security or compliance policy with a push of a button, but it should be continuous compliance. So in uh, uh, real time, uh, you should get uh, notifications if, for example, someone deploys an, let's say, uh, an S3 bucket uh, to the whole wide world, or if someone deploys an RDS database, uh, um, which is not uh, protected by encryption and, and stuff like this. So all of this, it's just two examples of, of thousands of possible things you can do with uh, compliance, of course. And uh, it should, of course, have, have the best possible security and apply to all the major vendors. Like it's the, the same that we saw uh, before also in uh, Demi's presentation, like AWS, Google Cloud, Azure, Kubernetes as being the key candidates that we see at our customers today. So the posture management allows you to keep track of your cloud environments. It gives you like a specific compliance score for your specific environments that you onboard it. Uh, at the moment, we deliver 40 different compliance and security frameworks uh, that you can just select and apply to your environment without having to create your own, uh, only, only uh, even a single uh, compliance check yourself. And these uh, consist of more than 1,800 different compliance rules for all those environments from Kubernetes to, let's say, AWS, Azure, Google Cloud. Um, for building the rules, of course, you can do this yourself. You can start with using our, our pre-compiled compliance uh, sets that we maintain and continuously update uh, and, and uh, take uh, specific checks and, and adapt them to your uh, needs so that you get your own company specific compliance, uh, compliance check. For this, we use uh, our GSL, our governance specification language. 
this is a very specific um, this is a very specific uh, language that allows you to specify your own compliance checks. It comes with a built-in uh, builder, uh, GSL builder, where you can uh, easily just select uh, for which kind of asset you want to uh, create your own check. So you could, for example, uh, just go on, uh, let's say, storage and select S3 bucket, and then you, you uh, get another selection where you can say should have, and then you can say uh, logging uh, equals enabled. As one very simple example where you can just uh, do like four mouse clicks and you build your own security check to verify that every S3 bucket that you have is, is uh, has logging enabled or is uh, not publicly exposed and stuff like this. And as you can see, it covers all kinds of assets from uh, Route 53 routes to security groups to storage to database to compute etc so it's extremely uh, flexible here if you would like to see more as we only have half an hour if you go to this uh, url that you can see here gsl.domain.com uh, you find a publicly reachable browser where you can go through all the different kinds of checks so you can say i want to see what's available for azure in the default policies which uh, checkpoint rates as critical and which is, relates to network security or logging or access management or something like this. So if you're interested, just uh, open it yourself and uh, have a look at the capabilities. Um, I mentioned before that we also do remediation. So it's very important that whatever is found in the cloud as everything there is, of course, very short lived um, can be also automatically uh, remediated. So we do this by using our cloud bots functionality. A cloud bot is basically um, a function as a service component that we give you in our Git repository, many, many different options. You just deploy them to your own cloud environment. And when then we have a finding in the platform, we just send a notification to the specific cloud bot, which then takes the action. As an example, um, if you have a compliance check that says uh, there's an uh, S3 buckets should never be publicly, completely publicly accessible, then this finding could trigger a cloud bot, which takes care of uh, closing and securing uh, the specific S3 bucket where the issue was found. And the idea why we why we actually put this as a function as a service, you might wonder, and not just like directly use APIs to do the change. Um, of course, you should always follow the least uh, privilege uh, principle. So we want our platform, which is also a SaaS service, to not uh, have more uh, permissions than it actually needs. So everything that actually does like changes remediation changes is therefore defined in your own environment and can only react to triggers from our platform in a secured way so that our platform can have at least privileges uh, than it would need to do this. Um, I just see, uh, see, see a question here in the chat uh, with one eye, uh, if we support like PCI, CIS, uh, et cetera. So, all of this stuff is of course there. We have uh, a regular, uh, uh, ready to use uh, cloud uh, compliance standards for PCI, for HIPAA, uh, for ISO, for GDPR, you name it. So it's, it's a whole bunch of things and, and, and uh, it also even applies to, to uh, it gives you like CIS benchmarks for secure Kubernetes deployments and everything uh, with a click on a button. Um, so we also allow you to, to visualize all your, your uh, assets in the cloud. So you can see all the accounts you onboarded, all the Kubernetes clusters, all the RDS databases, all the security groups. So all kinds of assets that exist in the cloud. And then you can take them and, for example, say you want to visualize the security groups within one uh, specific region in one account. And here, for example, we take the security groups from the cloud vendor. Um, and uh, categorize them. So we show you very easily in an overview which ones, for example, are publicly exposed to the whole wide world, world uh, which ones are partially open in the way that they are accessible from the internet, but only for specific uh, uh, restricted uh, uh, named IP addresses. And on the other side, which one is, for example, internal uh, only and not reachable at all from the internet. And you see also how they relate to each other. So which security group uh, allows traffic to or from uh, assets that belong to another security group. Um, we also visualize uh, the, the VPCs, for example, uh, if we speak about AWS as an example here. So you can see all the peerings, which VPC is connected to which other VPC. So you can easily see how is the 
all the relations and possible communications uh, in between your uh, VPCs. Um, so with that said, uh, in, in a very short overview, there's much more to it than I can cover here because there's such more components. Um, but uh, I would like to then uh, move over to the part of threat intelligence. So the, uh, starting again with the changes, we see that the cloud providers, of course, only give you a very narrow and cloud provider specific view typically. And uh, what uh, customers need in order to really have a secure picture, consolidated picture of their whole environment, of course, is a broad view across all multiple cloud uh, uh, providers, uh, also covering all the different vendors. Um, instead of a brief snapshot of historical logs, uh, as you typically get it, you should have like an enriched historical view and not just only having the logs, but also the data and, and, and the, the audits uh, coming into it. Um, when I speak here about enrichment, uh, let me just explain this a bit more. This means, for example, when you get a log from the cloud provider, a flow log, let's say, that just says communication was observed from APA, uh, IP address A to IP address B, then if you analyze the log afterwards, you have a strong issue because that IP might not even exist anymore. Because uh, looking at this uh, uh, volatile uh, world where everything is deployed automatically, out of scale, up and down, etc., cetera, uh, it's, it's a completely different challenge. So we are enriching this and giving additional attributes to, uh, for example, the IP addresses, uh, like what kind of asset was it? How was it configured? Were there open uh, issues with that asset in terms of compliance? Or did the container, if we talk about Kubernetes, did the container have uh, known vulnerabilities in third party components, uh, as we also heard in, in Demi's uh, presentation before? Um, that pose a risk to that container or pose a risk at the time of the, uh, where the log was created. So everything like this you get in a, in a consolidated uh, view. Um, it's also quite important that you get like instant notifications if there's an issue. So no, no, nothing, uh, it doesn't help you if like one hour or half an hour later after, after a breach could have been detected by looking at the logs, uh, you only then can, can take a proper action. So you need a platform which gives you like instant detections. And also, uh, as you are not able to, to manually look at all the logs in real time, it should also contain automatic remediation, of course, for all relevant data types. Um, so the goal here is to give you threat intelligence and prevention for all relevant contexts across all cloud environments. And uh, as explained before, the high definition context is the first uh, critical key thing where everything is like consolidated. Uh, so we, we even take information from what we call our threat cloud. So our, let's say, cloud-based reputation database. Uh, in a log, for example, you immediately see if that's a known malicious actor that, uh, for example, uh, operates a command and control server and stuff like this. We give you regional geographic information uh, for the logs. We can even feed like third party stuff inside here as well. Um, and then we allow you to do threat hunting in a visual way, in addition to, of course, the option to look at the logs. So here you see a visualization, for example, of flow logs in your cloud environment, where you can easily see which uh, asset in the cloud, be it an RDS database or an EC2 instance or Lambda function was communicating with which other assets in the cloud environment and also to the external world to, to some uh, IP addresses which don't have a bad reputation and also with uh, potentially uh, harmful IP addresses that already have bad uh, entries in terms of reputation. Uh, uh, yeah. So all of this is, of course, also automated. So we give you a, a, a whole set of policies that automatically do uh, all kinds of intelligence uh, hunting and, and, and threat detection based on all, all different kinds of logs. But you can also create your own. And I, I mentioned before that we have this GSL language uh, that allows you to specify your own compliance checks. The cool thing here is that this GSL language can be used uh, not just for writing your own compliance checks for all kinds of clouds, so for AWS, for Google Cloud Azure, or Kubernetes, but also you can use the same language to uh, actually create uh, checks and uh, yeah, security checks also that do log analysis based on those. So it's, it's, if 
people discuss like cost and PCO, et cetera. This is a very, very important aspect because it's not very likely that you find the proper developer that exactly knows how to code, let's say compliance checks for all of the big cloud players and also how to evaluate logs maybe in, in your third party uh, system that you are use, uh, using as a seam in your SOC, for example. So this gives you one single language to cover it all in a very easy and human readable way. This is just uh, two examples of how such a check uh, could look like. So for example, there is a predefined rule that says, is there any outbound traffic to any known Tor exit node in my environment? And then we, for all rules, of course, uh, same as in the compliance, we have like a description and tell you like how this could be remediated. And, and then you also see how the language looks like, like in this case, VPC flow log where action is accept and the destination uh, is uh, uh, known as a malicious IP address, as just one example. Um, now looking at uh, the challenges that uh, customers face or all enterprises face in terms of workload security. Um, usually uh, when people start in the cloud, they have almost no visibility about what's actually going on in terms of the workloads. Um, the protecting just the parameter is no longer working because there is no single parameter. So it's a highly distributed architecture across different cloud environments typically. So that also comes along with a high risk of misconfiguration happening, um, which means you need to have guardrails in place, uh, uh, protecting whatever you deploy and making sure that whatever uh, you decided to be the policy for deployments and configuration is always maintained. There's a lot of risks actually coming from using open source. So open source is, is wonderful and in, in what gives all of us in terms of features and functionality. But also if you look at the CVE uh, catalog, there's a lot of uh, things coming up with open source libraries and you need to make sure that you always use the latest version and, and, and get rid of vulnerable ones. So you need to have an automatic mechanism actually looking at this and uh, as we are speaking here, uh, also with focus on CI/CD, so all of this should happen in the CI/CD pipeline, not just after something was actually deployed to your cloud environment. As um, as we also learned before, looking at like external parties in the presentation of Demi, you are as secure as your weakest code, or maybe even the weakest code of your uh, the third party company which uh, delivers you stuff or operates your stuff, for example. And there's a high risk of privilege escalation. So you need to make sure that you definitely have the least privilege uh, configuration on your workloads, like on a function as a service, for example, um, that is actually needed for what the function is supposed to do. And thing occurring. So you need to have proper logging and, and mechanisms in place to look at all this stuff. So in our workload protection platform, we allow you, first of all, also to do proper governance with compliance rules, looking at all your workloads and uh, that already in the CICD pipeline, but also continuously after something was already put in production and is actually uh, running uh, in a live environment. Um, you need to do vulnerability management. This means, for example, code needs to be scanned like Kubernetes uh, images, Docker containers, but also the, the actual source code uh, of applications. And uh, when I spoke about compliance before, bringing this to the CICD pers perspective, this also means that it's important that you do not start doing your compliance only after you deployed something, but we allow you, for example, also to already take your Terraform templates uh, if you are already in the situation where you are following the infrastructure as code approach. Um, so, we allow you to scan the Terraform templates that actually deploy your cloud environments instead of having to deploy and only then seeing that something that you deployed is insecure. Um, yeah, and in terms of runtime protection, we, we offer like a multi-layer cloud native protection mechanism, which has several different components uh, protecting against threats, doing pattern matching, whitelisting, blacklisting, etc., and basically protects your workload. It's a bit different depending on which workload we're actually talking about, um, but this is like the generic perspective, let's say. Um, all of this uh, has to be automated, uh, should ideally be uh, driven by machine learning, by automatic code analysis, 
Um, so if we are able to do an automatic baselining for a workload, then it's also easy to see if, for example, looking at the container, suddenly there's a process spawn that never existed before in any of the containers uh, in, in, in uh, that uh, auto scaling uh, group of containers. Um, and then we can take uh, action accordingly. And also it's important to look at the, the full context of the protected workload starting from the code uh, up to the runtime situation uh, if you want to achieve maximum security. Um, if we uh, just look specifically, just taking out one example at Lambda functions, um, here's what we do. So we, we first of all, in the CICD pipeline, we already are able to automatically assess configuration risks. And also we give you uh, least privileged IAM roles that are most suitable for that Lambda functions and that you know if you have uh, over permissive configuration in that place. Then we are able to scan for dependency vulnerabilities and also see if someone maybe accidentally just forgot uh, credentials in the code, uh, which we would then, for example, use to actually block the, the uh, or let the, the pipeline deployment fail in that case. And you can also already uh, define and enforce your own policies and thresholds in, in uh, this case. So uh, technically, this means that, for example, we have uh, uh, tools that you can just put in your pipeline and they upload uh, the code or they do a local analysis of the container, for example, and scan for uh, specific stuff and, and based on this, take the decision if the pipeline can continue. And then uh, typically also deployed already in the pipeline, there's a self-protection layer that we put around your function as a service. And this is like a, like a security uh, layer which uh, helps you to detect and stop application attacks. Uh, typically, for example, uh, typically examples would be the OS uh, top 10, just mentioning some here. So this is really doing a threat prevention on your uh, containers. Um, but also uh, taking care of the automatic profiling and uh, automatic enforcement. Uh, so you make sure that there's only proper application behavior um, allowed. And you can also define your own zero trust boundaries across uh, functions in uh, multiple ways. Um, as the last major part, I would like to uh, have a look at the container protection. So this consists of uh, seven different pillars and usually with customers I talk at least one hour just about this part um, because it's so critical when you move to, to uh, highly agile microservice architectures. Um, so for container protection we see like seven key ingredients that you should have. So first of all uh, it's again about posture management similar like what you saw before. Of course you need to be, make sure that the posture of your containers is uh, perfect uh, and this is like uh, looking at the configuration of Kubernetes clusters of nodes of pods and all the stuff that belongs to it. And also there we have, for example, uh, uh, official standards like CIS benchmarks, etc, which you can uh, examine and enforce uh, with the click of a button. Then there's the part of the image assurance which takes care of verifying that the actual image yet that you want to deploy is uh, safe and secure looking at this, the, the stuff that's uh, part of the image like libraries like third party components open source stuff that you uh, have as part of your image. And uh, making sure that only secure images can actually then uh, pass the uh, CICD pipeline and there's a part of the runtime assurance In uh, the runtime assurance, we allow you to define guardrails which is just giving you some examples, you could restrict that only containers can be deployed that come from your own uh, container registry and not just from whatever uh, place that might have uh, might have been breached or something so many customers today have their own registries to be sure that that there's absolutely nothing in uh, in this registry which wasn't verified um, so that's something that you can do with the runtime assurance you can say if someone is uh, supposed to, to, to put a label on, on uh, some deployment or some port that this can only be done by persons that have a specific role as an example. Uh, if someone wants to delete the namespace, then this can only be done by specific persons. So everything that is uh, assuring that at runtime, there's no crazy configuration steps going on and this relies um, on the uh, component known as the admission controller in the uh, Kubernetes clusters. Then there's the part of web application and API protection. So here we allow you to 
uh, deploy your own uh, uh, like a protective uh, specific additional uh, pot in your environment which acts like a reverse proxy which uh, is, is your new ingress controller and as such uh, protects your web applications and specifically also your APIs against all kinds of attacks with, which uh, with a focused fully fledged let's say IPS uh, component inside with machine learning, which is automatic baselining, automatic policy generation, and much more. And you can also enforce your uh, API schemas using, for example, open schema, upload it, and then this component makes sure that uh, only uh, uh, allowed uh, values, for example, are used to access the API. Um, then there's the runtime protection, which, which looks inside the container while it's running. So this knows what processes are running, what files are there, if, if something is, is strange and new, which was never observed before and can protect the uh, uh, breaches here and uh, someone like taking over control of your containers or pods. Um, and uh, coming to the end, there's the intrusion detection, which is focused on, on looking at the actual logs. So we also take all the logs from your container environment and, and apply policies and detect if something strange is going on. So let's say one container was breached and this container starts doing a, a pod scan on other pods uh, inside your Kubernetes cluster or is accessing the master node in a strange way. This is something that would be detected by this part here. And last but not least, of course, you, we, we provide you the proper reports and dashboards where you can visualize all the stuff that's going on in terms of uh, security related stuff and blocks, et cetera, uh, for your container environment. So I'm also now coming to the, the end. I just wanted to put some stuff together so you can see how this relates to also the CI/CD pipeline integration following the shift left approach. So uh, on the early stages, we see, for example, the configuration scanning, which you should do in the CI/CD pipeline, also the code scanning, uh, for example. In the CI/CD pipeline, you can also scan, as mentioned before, your Terraform. Uh, templates or cloud formation templates that's temporarily not available at the moment because it's like updated to uh, let's say next generation but it will soon be available again um, and we are looking also at uh, giving you uh, the option to directly scan arm templates already here then we can detect and remediate drifts uh, with uh, our cloud bots uh, as presented before and you would do here already the container image scanning and then once it's deployed, there's uh, all the other stuff going on, protecting also the, your identity and access management. I didn't mention that before. So there's also a whole bunch of uh, functionality to protect that uh, critical part of uh, security of your environment. Uh, here you can also define the guardrails for, for network protection. You have the posture monitoring, uh, threat prevention continuously going on. This is where you do incident detection and response, and also you can protect your web applications and APIs. And with that said, I'm also uh, at the end of this session. Um, let me just invite you again for our upcoming session on March uh, 31st, um, where we do a one hour more deep dive session on pretty much the same topics, but just giving you some more insights and also allow you to discuss it. Um, if you're interested, just register for this one. And yeah, I think I can skip this one as I covered it all before. So thanks a lot um, for participating. And uh, are there any additional questions that remain open? Just check the q and It seems like everything was answered already. Okay, so if we don't have any additional questions, uh, thank you all for participating in this interesting meetup. Uh, thanks to Demi and Christopher, our speakers for today. We'll publish soon uh, this meetup on the Germany Clouds LinkedIn page. Uh, and we would like to see you in our uh, next uh, meetups. And uh, thank you and see you soon. Bye-bye. 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 Thank you, everyone. Bye -bye.